the artist Terry Sollen invited me to see her show at the Crane Arts Building. It's comprised of five different bodies of work, but all of them are related to one another. Uh, my name is Terry Sollen. Uh, I've been a member at Tiger Strikes Asteroid for the past eight years. This is my third solo show with the gallery. The work in the show is mainly based on memories, um, a lot from my next door neighbor, Quintina Bianca Malaragna. When I first moved into my old South Philadelphia house, everything that was falling down was buttressed with scrap wood, tied up with nude colored nylon stockings, and slathered with concrete. The supported structures were a mysterious and curious landscape that served as a record of the architectural history of my home. My neighbors Quintina and Mario were alchemists who could fix anything with a piece of string. Memories are delicate constructions. They are a labyrinth, a vast and intricate novel that at once documents and interrupts, creating floating entry points and a universe of emotions in every corner. In the Shaker spirit, I imagine a tiny wasp worker making imaginary homes for important collections of most special memories. The show's organized so that when you come in, there's a small area that has mostly paper constructions. When you look up, you will see a fascinating installation of writings and drawings on vellum. The words were originally written by Quintina. Actually, her notes from when she was in school really important to me. I'm a teacher, so looking at them resonated with me and how children learn today. And looking at memorization and writing things down was really interesting to me. Me tracing her tracings became really meaningful. The drawings and words are hard to decipher, and adding to the mysterious tone are some small rocks perched on top of the papers. I collect rocks from places that I've been. There's different little memories attached to those, and some of them relate to the writing and the drawings. Some of the drawings that are more floral-based are ideas and thoughts that were in areas where those rocks came from. There are ones that are made of dryer sheets dipped in porcelain to make the paper. I love these three little drawings and asked her how she got the idea for them and how she created them. Memories of laying on my back in the yard, <laughs> looking up, trying to find meteor showers. First I make the paper by dipping dryer sheets into porcelain slip, laminating them together. When those are dry, I take some of my drawings and I Xerox them. I make an ink out of linseed oil and mason stains. The Xerox papers are sensitized with some gum arabic and that makes it so the ink will only stick to the black lines of the drawing. Then I basically ink them up just like a litho stone and then wash them off with a little water so the ink is in the lines. And then I just lay the damp paper onto the porcelain paper and then peel it off and the image is transferred onto the clay. After the image is transferred, I use small components that end up in the larger sculptures, almost like a 3D drawing material. So those are scored and slipped onto the surface of the paper. And then they get fired in the kiln. The dryer sheets burn away and I'm just left with porcelain paper. You're left with incredibly beautiful art. Thank you very much. Here's a third distinctive body of work. Terry told me that the school where she teaches sent her with some students to Ireland. While there, she painted these sensitive landscapes using the medium of gouache. I teach at the Agnes Irwin School ceramics, drawing and painting, and then recently this year I'm teaching graphic design and media arts. Terry told me that she hadn't painted for a long time before doing these, but she certainly hasn't missed a step. A fourth body of work reminded me of cubist relief sculptures, and they were made out of a different material. There are ones that are made of cardboard. There is a series of five that is hopefully going to end up being 25, in addition of a similar paper landscape. 
based on mineral specimens that I collect. And when I went to Ireland, I saw a lot of super rocky places and I really wanted to work in clay when I was there at first, but it wasn't available. So as a, like a makeshift thing, I decided to work out some of the things that I was thinking about in clay and paper, which ended up being a really great exploration. I am quite familiar with Cherry's fifth body of work, a group of freestanding ceramic sculptures. I first met her two years ago when she was part of a group exhibition at the Center for Art in Wood, and she exhibited similar works there. But this time, she had some unique help. I had the opportunity to collaborate with an amazing sculptor, Gregory Emore. Greg Emore has fabricated all of the pedestals and findings that the pieces are hung. He laid out the entire room and thought to do this lens on the ceiling. We've known each other for more than 25 years. Greg is a fantastic sculptor, designer, and fabricator. He's quietly designed many memorable features in restaurants and hotels throughout the city and internationally. In her review of Terry's show, Philadelphia Inquirer critic Edith Newhall wrote about how Gregory Emore's backdrops enhanced her work. Solon's sculptures look more solid against this installation's dark, substantial supports than they did when shown on white pedestals. I agree. It's a beautiful way to frame these complex pieces, which are informed not only by memory, but by literature. I was reading The Art of War <laughs> and Gertrude Stein at the same time, which is sort of a weird mix. But there are a lot of little bits and pieces of that that resonated with me, and most of the sculptures are almost about fortifying yourself. One of the other things that has had the deepest impact on how I make my work, I was a chef for eight years at Judy's Cafe, working for the wonderful Eileen Plato. Cooking has had such a big impact on everything, like the way that I prepare materials. I generally create 10 to 15 different components, like uh, miso plots, and have these things chopped up and ready to make a recipe from. It's also a lot to do with how memories are like the recipe of who you are. I studied with Bill Walton, a Philadelphia artist. He also tapped into the whole idea of my cooking experience, and one of the best things from having him as a mentor was that he looked at my work and he said, Terry, you know what? I think you just need to make the perfect bite. <laughs> like, stop trying to throw the kitchen sink in and pare down some things and, and, and just try to make a really good spoonful, like a perfect appetizer. Huh, a good appetizer. I, for one, felt completely full, aesthetically speaking, after feasting my eyes on Terry's show. I asked her what she wanted people to get from her work. What I would want people to come away with is an idea of reverie, imagining how memories could become bigger and bigger and bigger with time. I think that that's one of the most important things about my work is that I spend a lot of time, and over that time that things become imbued with much more meaning for me. As I sit here editing my movie about Terry, it's five days before Christmas. No season brings more of a sense of reverie and remembrance of bygone times. So as we take a final look at Terry's profoundly moving work, let me honor a pledge to my subject, who is not only a great artist, but a great teacher. They're amazing students. <laughs> we have an incredible chorus, also two incredible music teachers at our school, Elizabeth Weigel and Murray Servar and sometime I'll show you some videos of the children singing. And maybe they'll even be in this movie. That would be great. <laughs> that would be a holiday treat.